Hello, multi monstrous malt munchings, and thank you to Willem Killian for that malt mention. Thank you, Willem. Um, and this is Ralphie Review 934 Extras, and it is the final part of a three part series on understanding, identifying quality casks. And I'm really just passing on the knowledge that I've gained over a few decades of speaking to coopers, visiting distilleries, hanging around warehouses, listening into conversations in bars, talking to industry professionals, talking to industry enthusiastic anoraks um, and people who are super keen on whiskey. Uh, at times it gets a little bit unsettling for the distilleries when they can get a visitor out of the blue um, who knows more about the distillery than they do. Uh, this is happening more and more and it's not just whiskey anoraks and geeks knowing more about the distillery, it's knowing more about the whiskey to a degree which is unprecedented historically. It's a few decades ago that by virtue of availability of supply of serious good quality casks from the USA, ex-bourbon casks from the USA, uh, occasionally the rye cask, occasionally the, the corn whiskey casks, but probably about 99% of casks coming over still whole and wet from the USA were ex-bourbon casks made of good quality air-dried wood which had been coopered the old-fashioned way, in other words without too much pressure and productivity levels and Basically, the people who were coopering just left to get on with the job for which they were trained without too much stress and pressure. It's very different nowadays. Everything's all time controlled and coopers in the US, many of them are paid in productivity. Their pay will depend on how many casks they actually cooper in a day and therefore it's in the interests not only of the coopers for their pay but for the some, many, not some, many of the bourbon producers to get their casks through the system as cheaply and as quickly as possible because after all, by law, they're only going to be used once to mature bourbon and 80, 90, well 90% of all the bourbon that's matured it's just young stuff, it's only about two years old. It's non-age stuff, it's not sipper stuff, it's mixing and banging a shot down your neck in a bar somewhere type liquor. Do you know, honestly, bourbon is not given due respect and, one, and this is one reason why a lot of bourbons out there are very generic and cheap. And they're totally brand led and you just have to look at Jim Beam or Jack Daniels to see whether it be bourbon or Tennessee whiskey, call it what you want, they're all grain whiskies. All of them are grain whiskies. Um, they're a fairly generic brand led experience and rather like Coca-Cola, it's the label that's selling, not the content. But in the old days, and you'll notice this if you're in the US and you go to a general auction or someone's selling, clearing out an old cupboard and they discover an old bottle of bourbon from yesteryear and you taste it, you're tasting a different generation where the corn was not genetically modified and enhanced the way it is now. The, the yeast was added, to the fermentation and the mash and the sour mash used, it was a lot slower. It was more paced, more measured. It was more designed for quality. See the good old days, particularly after Prohibition. See with Prohibition there were big competition, we want to get people back drinking again. So let's make sure we've got the quality in the bottle. And the only reason the way you get quality in the bottle is to get the quality out of the casks. And even now around the world you've got some distillers who claim that casks don't have much influence on whiskey. Bullshit. Flannel and disingenuous misinformation. Ignore what these people are saying. Casks have an enormous influence on whiskey. Because if they didn't, they wouldn't even be used. And all whiskey would be white.
What's really changed over the last 30 years is the economics of production. Without doubt, in the old days, it was a tough job, but there was more, I wouldn't say a relaxed pace, but there was more of an understanding that it takes a certain amount of time for a cask to be constructed by a cooper properly. But now we're in a moment in time where casks are thrown together at lightning speed and when it's only when you actually sit a good cask beside a bad, badly made cask and start to look through the magnifying glass at the quality of the joints of the seals of the calibre of the rings, the steel rims that are going round to hold the container together. Whether the barrel heads are using proper wooden rolls or driven galvanised pins to hold them together. How thick is the wood? How thin is the wood? How neat is the job? How fragrant is the wood? I mean, we've not even got to the point where we've put anything into these casks yet. They're still in the cooperage. But you can walk up to a cast, you can you can knock it slightly. How, how does it ring? Does it have a bell-like note or is it kind of dull and flat? This tells with to a, a tuned ear, an experienced ear, it tells you a hell of a lot. Even the barrel edge, the, the, the chine around the, the head of the barrel, how thick is it? How thin is it? What size is the pore of the wood? Is it quite rough or is it perhaps smoother? Is it a finer fibre in that stave or a coarse fibre? Coarse fibres are faster growing trees. They grow faster, therefore the fibres aren't as tight in the structure of the trunk. Wood is not equal, trees are not equal. You get hundreds of contributing contributing natural flavour chemicals from wood that go into maturing whisky. And it's not just the chemicals in the wood, it's the calibre of the wood to moderate the oxidisation over time of the contents of the whisky. I mean, th this is talking about the quality of, it's the, it's the knowledge, Montmaze, it's the knowledge. We've not even got to the previous content of the barrel, whether it be sherry or bourbon or port or Madeira or red wine or white wine or whatever. We're still in the wood. Has that wood been air dried over three to five years to gradually, systematically reduce the moisture level? Or was it put through a baker's oven at oven temperature to blast out the excessive moisture in the newly planed wood? And in doing so, it drives out half the flavour chemicals because they are literally roasted right out of the wood. And if they're not there when it comes to toasting the cask and then charring the cask, you just don't have the same quality of, of process. If you have got half dead wood from the tree due to the processing, cheaply sourced, you can toast it all you want, but you're never going to get out anything out of that wood that was never in there in the first place. So fast growing, commercial trees from a massive plantation on a heavy budget are not going to give you the same results as carefully selected trees which are then selectively harvested from different altitude locations and then they are better processed, better cared for, better harvested, better planed, better conditioned and then a far better place for passing on as flat packs pieces of wood to be turned into staves at a cooperage. See when you smell the inside of a really good proper American cask, or a French wine cask, or a French cognac cask that's made of Lamazin oak. It's night and day, mates. It really is, compared to the cheap crap 
which has been basically out there because it's all that's needed to produce the cheap crap that's going into the bottle as generic brand led products which are then punted onto the masses, the passive masses, through blingy advertising. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong. It makes a lot of commercial sense to do that. If you're making a cheap product that's reliant on expensive marketing, there's no need to be sourcing decent wood. You just don't need it. Problem is, when these casks, whether intact or, f or dismantled and heaven help us ship flat pack over to Scotland are then reassembled. If you've got bad wood in that cask, in the staves, you can only get a bad cask no matter how well it's coopered. And don't get me wrong, inert wood has its place. I use inert wood for one of my little cask projects I'm doing on my Patreon channel. But that's because I'm using inner staves and I want a more dramatic return in smell and taste for using these inner staves. Because I can do that, because it's my cask and it's not in Scotland. But see over time, as you are chatting to people at distilleries, you pick up general information from your tour guides. But there's only so much, and it doesn't matter which distillery you're visiting anywhere in the world. Your tour guides are doing their job and generally they're doing a good job to the best of their ability. It's a very repetitive job and it's now and again some, someone's going to ask stupid questions, be a bit of an arsehole and they've got to just get over it and get on with their day. It's not a job that's particularly glamorous. But being polite and considerate to these people and say, is there anyone here at the distillery that I can talk to about casks? Just purely about casks and wood. And perhaps if, a, if, if a, the manager's not busy or a supervisor's not busy or the warehouse for, foreman or foreman is not busy, they will actually take you into the warehouse seeing as showing, you're showing interest and you're asking questions that general public do not ask in tours. Then they're going to show an interest and they're going to show you that, you know, we've got these casks this is the reason that we've bought these casks because the type of wood and the influence of previous content, if we're, casks are still wet, suits our style of liquor. And it suits it in this way because we're looking for a certain result. For example, illustrative example, if it's a Scotch whisky distillery and it's in Speyside and it's a light whisky, you do not want great big heavy sherry impact if it doesn't suit the style of single malt you're producing. Example, Ben Rinnis. Splendid example. Glenfiddich, brilliant example. Balvenie, good example. So they're, they're going to be say, basically saying the majority of our casks are ex-bourbon casks from, say, Four Roses Distillery or Heaven Hill Distillery. So better quality distilleries, better quality casks. Simples. Because these, these distilleries bottle more bourbons and more whiskies for sipping the higher end stuff. And it shows in the smell and taste when you buy them. They say, well, you get these casks in because they're slightly sweeter. They're the vanilla notes from the American oak. They're slightly aromatic and that suits the particular signature we're getting off our still. Illustrative examples, Ochentoshin, without a doubt. Ochentoshin, absolutely bourbon. Daff Mill, bourbon. Other examples, Tam Navullen, bourbon. <laughs> I'm now thinking of all these distilleries that use a combination of American oak and European oak egg and others, bourbon and sherry casks together in different ratios. Who said it was easy, malt mates? If it was easy, anybody could open a distillery. The thing is, at this moment in time, there's people without experience and without the contacts opening distillery. They're struggling to get the casks they need. They can get casks, but they're not necessarily casks they need. They'll be adequate, they'll hold, they'll hold the liquor, but they won't work the magic. 
um, and it's the distilleries anywhere in the world that have got a bit more experience behind them and that have understood their mission statement before they even start, that are sourcing better casks and sure they're charging more for the product, fine, because they're investing in the price through the quality. So I hope this really helps you get more of an understanding of the quality of casks. It's not just about bad casks smell sour and look rubbish and good casks smell sweet and look amazing. It doesn't work that way. You can have some scabby old casks that will work a miracle on whiskey and some spanking new lovely golden boy looking cask that absolutely wrecks a whiskey simply because it was left sitting in a warehouse too long and the inside went rancid. So you can't go in appearances with casks. Absolutely not. I'm going to conclude by just mentioning that when you're smelling and tasting whiskey over time, you will pick up on notes in the whiskey which you're not sure whether you like them or you don't like them. And what you're really needing to do is give yourself more time to become more familiar with these notes to understand them and frequently particularly with age whatever a whiskey tastes like is coming less and less from the still signature from the actual new make spirit and it's becoming more and more from the cask the individuality the singularity the provenance the pedigree the caliber of that cask and when you identify distilleries which are consistent in their use of quality casks, mark it in your diary for future purposes because if they're producing good whiskey today in their first fill casks, they'll be producing good whiskey tomorrow in their second fill casks, which are the first fill casks which were good being refilled and they're still good. I'm Ralphie, thank you for watching. I hope you found this cask knowledge and quality of casks useful, informative, and uh, helping you with your malt mission. I'm Ralphie, over and out. Bye-bye.